But uh, anyway, thanks a lot, Shannon, and, uh, and thanks also for reading the second time with us. And so our next reader is Nigel Assam. He was born in Trinidad, but has spent most of his life in the United States. He is published, but not frequently, so you may be hearing it for the first time. He's also a good friend, and I'm really glad to see him. He works in publishing and editing? He used to work in publishing. He used to work in publishing, but now he's, uh, he's starting a new life in reading aloud. Come on. Okay, um, wow. It's a work in progress, an essay. It's called A Tongue's Tradition. Um, color without the color or color. When I first wrote, I wasn't conscious or concerned if the English I used was American English or British English. But for how certain words were pronounced, to me, they were both the same language, and to some degree, they still are. Yet, there are times as I do pause to consider which English I ought to employ. For most people, this would seem trivial. This would not be something to spend any time over, especially if you have spent your life in the same country in which you were born, or if you emigrated to an English-speaking country and your mother tongue was not English, you would certainly adopt your new country's grammar and syntax for integration's sake. I do concede that probably the issue is not too much of anything, but it is something. I was born in Trinidad on the outskirts of the capital port of Spain. It was very late on a Tuesday night on 30th October 1973. There was the Gulf of Perea just beyond the highway that passed outside the hospital window. By this time, Trinidad and Tobago had been an independent twin island nation for 11 years. In three years to come, a republic. And gone the governor, who was only a titular representation for Britain. I was raised and educated under the British educational system. Society overall was British influenced. At the same time, there was evidence of the North American culture had made its way down to us. The old World War II base in Shagaramus that still stood and though the campus was overgrown with weeds and grass, and some of the buildings were in disuse. And there was the Churchill Roosevelt Highway rushing south through Aruka. And closer than those, another flashes of American influence, including, of course, television, was this, that my father's family had the West Indian outlet for Harina outboard engines. Six weeks after I turned 14, I moved with my mother and two sisters to Florida. My father had already been up there for a year. Entering junior high school at that age and with a definite accent made one conspicuous. I remember being asked by fellow students to say something just so they can hear my accent. The reaction ranged from some finding it melodic, like a sing-song, a female classmate once said, to funny, or as an adolescent would typically say back then, cool, or just weird and something to be imitated in a humiliating fashion. It must be recognized that at this point I was afraid to speak up in class sometimes. It was not due to any fear of being ridiculed because of an accent, rather it was that I stammered sometimes. As I was separated from the traditional system I grew up in and was now in the North American educational system, certain words, color, neighbor, gray, center, etc. Some instructors understood the reason behind this and did not penalize me or point out that some instructors understood the reason behind this and did not penalize me if I inserted a U or spelled a gray with an E or placed my R before E in certain words. I do remember an English instructor in Florida who rather enjoyed I did this. Over time, however, the spelling of these and other words would become Americanized, as would my accent that slowly dissolved, though not all the way. I do remember one day when I was very young and was sitting on the steps of my grandmother's house in Woodbrook, 
and looking out to the garage and the back gates. I was sitting with my father and asked him, how do they say tomato in America? Tomato, he answered, and I practiced to saying it like that, instructing myself that the second T had to sound as a D, which was strange to me. And the A, as I said it as A, was to be sounded as A-Y, as in B. This didn't stick, however. There was a period when I paused before specific words, wondering which English I should employ. Language is conscience, and everyone must have one. Did I? There was the guilt of betraying childhood's teachers who taught me tradition, spelling color with the U, gray with the E, center R-E, and saying bonnet instead of hood, or flat instead of apartment, or the dole for welfare. I'll decide on the situation, I concluded, and that it depends on what I'm doing and whom I'm talking to, or if there was a young woman I would impress. Because my accent never fully dissolved, my question of grammar and spelling didn't disappear. Becoming aware that on public television there were broadcasts of some of the British comedies I grew up watching in Trinidad, I watched them again whenever I could. Series such as Are You Being Served or Benny Hill or To the Manor Born and others were seen only because of the sake of re-educating myself and relearning my tongue's tradition. The exclamation bloody still stuck with me. Through these series and constant contact with childhood tradition through my family, I resumed saying pavement instead of sidewalk and resolved similar dilemmas, coming to the eventual conclusion which was liberating. There is no other word to use. Why not use both Englishes? I have lived most of my life here in the United States and although I am not a citizen, its jargon has formed me as much as, they say, the Queen's. So what is the use of guilt? Why do I have to choose? Is it that I must learn the art of fidelity? One of the above mentioned situations can be illustrated in the following. It depends on if I'm reading a British or an American poet, Auden or Lowell. If I'm reading anyone from Chaucer to Shakespeare to Ben Johnson or anyone after, and even contemporary, the British pronunciation is automatic. Everything on the page influences my tongue. If I'm reading Whitman or Hart Crane or Lowell or others, my tongue unconsciously alters to the American manner of pronunciation. And this can occur regardless of whether I start with one side of the Atlantic and switch immediately to the other side. And then an in-between occurs when I'm reading Walcott, the West Indian speech more influenced by the British. If I were to pronounce the words of a British poet in an American jargon, the poem would not come through directly, even correctly, to me, or vice versa. Not one for identity politics, this question, though, of my tongue's tradition does include the idea of identity. Identity affords loyalty. Like my heritage, which does not afford me the ability, unfortunately so, of checking off ethnic boxes on forms and applications, the ease with which I can slip back and forth between accents denies me identity. In this in-between state, I possess the possibility to be protean. Yet, I understand the desire and even the necessity to claim a certain loyalty, if even through language alone. And here is where an answer may become available. North American English has its roots in British English. So if my accent were to successfully dissolve, which it won't, I'm certain of that, my tongue would still behave in its tradition, though another variation of that tradition. I see another variation because like the English spoken in the United States or Canada, or any other place outside of England, the English spoken in Trinidad is its own variation. Is it adultery, this lack of fidelity to one form of English over another form of English? Is it impossible to serve both forms of English and not love only one in favor of hating the other? 
Airplane and aeroplane are not far apart from each other and they mean the same thing. And I will just end with a poem if that's okay. Lapirus, it's a cemetery. From my grandfather on, my family was supposed to be buried in Lapirus Cemetery across from Queen Victoria Square in Trinidad. Back there, there's no family mausoleum. I remember his grave, shoots of grass from between stones, the corners of the cross blunted, and the two narrow street wide enough even, and the two narrow street, and the two narrow streets wide enough only for a brougham passing at his feet, and the chipped cube at sunset a dull tropical concrete gray. After only ten years, the sea salted air was already eroding his name's inscription and birth date. So illegible, light flattened the stone's face. Only ten years. No one has died since he died in 1974 except his mother, and half of his children are here in America, my father among them. My father hasn't discussed where his and my mother's burial should be, or his brother's, or any, or, or any f family plot, or whether they'd be flown back to be buried in Trinidad. Cost will make that decision. My father hasn't even made his will yet. Doubtless, his two sisters and their families, and his two brothers and their families, and his mother, who all stayed back, will be buried back there in Laperouse alongside my grandfather. For his children, it's different. Our lives were lived more here in America and less there. My sister has her own family and certainly will be buried beside her husband in Florida, where his father died. He has already purchased plots and even hopes to move to Florida soon. I have neither wife nor child. I've played with the idea of cremation and having my ashes thrown into the Atlantic that beaches both countries. My, f my grandfather's grave, I recall, looked too small. It lies in a rehabbed and redecorated cemetery, a block up from which still is the electric ice factory, and next to that, Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission, with its black rim steel towers that had in bold black letters down their columns, T and Tech, they've been repainted PowerGen.